Let's pray, and then we will take some time to prepare our hearts to worship the Lord. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for this day that you've given us. And even though it's cold outside, uh, the fellowship is warm in here, and it is just great to be uh, in this place where we can gather together with the saints to worship you. So help us now as we do that to turn our hearts towards you, put aside the distractions of the week, and that we would uh, uh, sing these songs, pray these prayers, and study your word with all our attention because that's what you deserve. And we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. It's good to see all of you this morning. Would you stand and join with us in singing praise to our God? for that grace this morning. Hallelujah. 
that what a Savior we have. key question today, folks. Everybody got your uh, Christmas gifts bought? It's right around the corner, so we'll give the Lord the glory and thanks for all that we are blessed with. So let's talk to him. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We give you praise. We honor your name. We thank you, Father, for your spirit, for your word of truth that we can rely upon, Father, before, because it is just it is the desired word that you want us to hear. And then in this day, Father, we pray that that word of truth would be made mention. And Father, we would go away from this place with a new thought of how to give you honor and glory and serve you this coming week. Father, we thank you for the jobs that we have and the means of income. Lord, the way you provide for us. Lord, help us to give back with a cheerful heart a portion of that which you have given to us this day, and it may bring glory and honor to you and give you all the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I should have sang that a little bit louder. I could hear some of you. <laughs> Let's uh, stand and sing again, please. Trembles 
you, Kathy, Tim, for leading us in uh, singing this morning. Hey, if you are in school age up to fourth grade, I would love it if you would join me up here up front. Come on up. Uh, well, not often. How are we doing? He's not in school. That's okay. We'll let him sit up here. We'll let him sit up here. How are you guys doing today? Good. Fantastic. Do you like school? Yeah. Yes. Good, because I have a test for you today. <laughs> no, it's not really a test, but I'm going to teach you a new vocabulary word. Are you ready? Yeah. The word is yeah. affliction. There's a lot of letters in that word, huh? Yeah. Do you have you ever heard that word before? Affliction? Yeah. yeah. No, it's a new one. You heard who heard it? You did what's affliction mean? Um, I don't you don't know. Yeah. I didn't think you would. It's a, it's a new word, but I want to teach you this word, okay? Affliction. Affliction means it's another word. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that's that's very pretty. Affliction means suffering. That's all, that's what that's all it's just another word for suffering. So if somebody afflicts you, that means they're making you suffer, right? You guys ever suffer? Never? You never suffer, ever? I think, don't think that's right. Have you ever been sick? Yeah. Okay, do you like to be sick? I had COVID. You had COVID, yeah. Was it fun? Did you like it? Why not? Why, why, do, why didn't you like it? Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, be, being sick is no fun, is it? No, because you're suffering, right? You're in pain. You don't feel good. You can't eat. You can't sleep. Or sometimes that's all you can do is sleep. Thank you. Yep, all that stuff. So, so... Let's think, of, let's think of some different kinds of afflictions, okay? Some different kinds of suffering. How about failing a test? Would that be suffering? How about getting in a fight with your friend? What about being picked on or bullied or being made fun of at school? 
None of those things would be fun, would they? No, those are all very unpleasant things. We, that, all of those would qualify as afflictions. Can you think of any others? What are some other things that would be an affliction? Okay, yeah. Some, one of your brothers or sisters being mean to you? Absolutely. Yeah, it hap- I know, it happens, but you don't have to rat them out right now. <laughs> what else? What else? That's okay. All right, you think about it. But, but you're, those kinds of things are all afflictions, okay? Now, here's my question. Why does God let us suffer? Why does God let us be afflicted? Why doesn't he, whenever, when, if something like that happens, why doesn't he just fix the problem and make it go away? Yeah, well, it, we would like that, wouldn't we? But it doesn't always happen, does it? Sometimes we have to go through those difficult things. Why do we have to do that? The reason is because good things, sometimes good things can come from affliction, believe it or not. Good things can come out of affliction, right? A lot of it depends on our attitude, though, okay? I want to read you something from the Bible. It's in Psalm 119, verse 71. He says, it is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. Do you know what statutes are? No. Now, we got two vocabulary words today. What? Statutes are just commands, right? Things that we're told to do, like rules. In this case, he's talking about the rules that are in this book right here in the Bible. Okay? So in other words, what he says is the good, it's good when we go through difficult suffering because it helps us to learn the Bible. It helps us to learn the commands that he gives us. Do you know how that works? How does that work? How do we learn the Bible through our suffering? Do you know? I feel like I'm being afflicted right now. <laughs> What am I learning? What am I learning? learning? Hmm. See, here's what happens. Some of the stuff that we learn in the Bible, it's easy to believe when things are great, right? It's easy to believe when when we're doing fine. It's when things are not so fine that we really have to trust in God's word and lean on it to help us get through those hard times, right? That's when it, that's when we really learn. And that's what he's talking about here. Okay? That's why he says it's good to be afflicted because something good comes out of it. We learn from it. We especially learn about God from it. Okay? So here's my advice to you. Whenever you're afflicted, whenever you're suffering, some of those things we talked about, ask this question. God, what good can come from this? What can I learn from this? Okay? And if you have that attitude, it helps us get through those hard times. Okay? All right, good. Now we'll head downstairs, which is what I think you guys really wanted anyway. Ah, 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 we have a couple of young ladies today. So you have to wait, right? You have to be afflicted with patience. Quick, quick. There you go. That's a good one. Great job, guys. Oh, I guess he decided he didn't want one. Do you want to take one to your brother since he forgot to get one? Okay. Make sure you give it to him, okay? Honor system. See you guys. <laughs> okay. I don't know. That's, I, I don't think it would be fair to call that affliction. Because I love those kids. I love it when they're here. Okay, let's pray and see what God has for us in his word today. Our Heavenly Father, thankful for these children. We're thankful that they're here to, uh, to learn your word. We pray that they will learn it and that they will take root in their hearts. And I pray that for us as well. Uh, even though many of us are much older, uh, we still have a lot that we can learn. And I pray that today's sermon will be helpful 
in our walk with you, our daily walk with you. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm assuming that most of us in here today, and probably it would be fair to say all of us, have experienced some affliction in our lives. And uh, we probably don't enjoy it. Is that a fair assumption? Yeah. Are you tracking with me so far? Um, and of course, I realize there's different levels of affliction, right? There's a big difference between your car breaking down. That can be inconvenient. And filing for bankruptcy, that would be a whole different level of affliction. There's a big difference between catching the flu and being diagnosed with cancer, right? We understand there's levels of affliction. And I think in particular sickness, Ill, illness, physical um, health issues in particular are difficult because there's usually nothing that we did or can do about them, right? People get sick because we live in a fallen world and sickness happens. It's not always because I did something. And, and, and in particular, like when children you know, seemingly get sick without rhyme or reason, why, does, why, do, why do three-year-olds get cancer? Or why do they get these terrible conditions that, that puts them in the hospital? things like that. Why does that happen? It's difficult for us to deal with because it seems unfair. It seems not right. And it isn't. It's a symptom of a broken world that we live in. But when we're in those situations, children, but even ourselves, and, and, and we're dealing with some really difficult affliction, sometimes it is very, very hard to find the silver lining to try to find some good in that situation. And I think we're going to see a good example of that in this morning's passage. So if you have your copy of the scriptures, please turn with me. We're going to go back to our study in the book of Isaiah. And this morning we're going to be in chapter 38. Isaiah 38. And I'm going to start reading in verse 1. It says, in those days, Hezekiah was sick and near death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amoz, went to him and said, Thus says the Lord, set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. Then Hezekiah turned his face toward the wall and prayed to the Lord and said, Remember now, O Lord, I pray, how I have walked before you in truth and with a loyal heart, and have done what is good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. And the word of the Lord came to Isaiah, saying, Go and tell Hezekiah, Thus says the Lord, the God of David your father, I have heard your prayer, I have seen your tears, surely I will add to your days fifteen years. I will deliver you and this city from the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend this city. And this is the sign to you from the Lord that the Lord will do this thing which he has spoken. Behold, I will bring the shadow on the sundial which has gone down with the sun on the sundial of Ahaz ten degrees backward. So the sun returned ten degrees on the dial by which it had gone down. So sickness is the specific affliction that is being mentioned in this passage here today. And because of that, I've entitled this sermon, When Sickness is a Blessing. And of course, sickness is a affliction that I think most of us are familiar with to some degree or another, some more than others. But we can apply these lessons that we're going to learn today to any affliction, no matter what it is. It doesn't have to be sickness. It can be anything. It can be financial. It can be relationship those things can sometimes be a blessing. And I think this concept may be strange to some people. And you may be asking, Pastor Sean, how can sickness or any adversity, for that matter, be a blessing? How is that even possible? 
Well, I want you to notice here, Isaiah chapter 38, beginning in verse 1, is it, we start with the phrase, in those days. In those days. What days? Which days are we talking about here? Um, if you have been with us, uh, we just finished up chapter 37 last week, the story of how God delivered the nation of Judah from the Assyrian army. They had been threatened. There was an army camped around their gates. They were being threatened. Uh, they were being told, surrender or die, and God sent an angel, wiped out the entire army. They didn't even have to pick up a single sword. I think that it, in those days probably means shortly thereafter, just right after that, in those days, the ones we were just talking about, chapter 37. Now, there are some people who think this actually takes place before that. And the reason they do is because if you saw that, verse 6, he talks about delivering this city from the hand of the king of Assyria right there. And so, that, so some people take this ch chapter and put it before that. But I don't think we need to do that. Um, this same sequence of events that we see here in Isaiah 36, 37, 38 is exactly the same way it's presented to us in 2 uh, Kings. And in 2 Chronicles, they appear in exactly the same order, all these events, the parallel passages. And so it seems more likely that this, this is the proper order, first 36 and 37, then 38. And I think that uh, what's probably happening is even though they've been uh, delivered from the Assyrian army and Sennacherib went back to his land, as we saw last week, and, and died there. But remember, the last thing it said was that Esarhaddon, his son, became king in his place. So Assyria didn't go away. Yes, they've got a different king now. Yes, they've suffered this defeat. But Assyria is still very much a threat and perceived as a threat by them. And so it's not, it, it's not surprising that, once again, Isaiah would be telling them, don't worry about it. God still got your back. He's still going to protect you from the nation of Assyria. So I think this is the right order. This comes after those events. So when it says in those days, it means just after this great victory. So then the question becomes, okay, why now is Hezekiah sick? In those days, Hezekiah was sick. So sick, in fact, that he's near death. But why? Well, no reason is given. We're not told here. We're not told in any of the parallel passages. We don't know why he's sick. Um, it could be that this is just one of those random things, right? Like we talked about. People in this world get sick. Why? It's a broken world. There's diseases floating around. The human body breaks down and has problems. Could be just that could also be very purposeful. Could be God doing something in his life. Remember that Hezekiah is a godly king, but he is by no means a perfect person. He's got his issues. And when we look at scripture, scripture does not sugarcoat history for us. All through the scriptures, when you read the stories of the things that happened, we see our, the, he, the great heroes of the faith, but they're flawed. They're not perfect. They have problems. They commit sin. They don't do everything right. And even the villains in the stories are not like just black hats with twirling their mustache, right? They, they have sometimes some redeemable qualities. It's not all black and white. Well, Hezekiah is a godly man. We know that. 2 Kings chapter 18 and verse 5 says, for example, Hezekiah trusted in the Lord God of Israel so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor who were before him. Well, that sounds pretty good, right? That sounds like a great endorsement. He's a great guy. But then we also have 2 Chronicles 32, 25. But Hezekiah did not repay according to the favor shown him. For his heart was lifted up. Therefore, wrath was looming, looming over him and over Judah and Jerusalem. So see, he's just like you and me. He's got his good qualities, but he's got his bad ones too. 
Yeah, he's a godly king. He's also a prideful man. And Scripture doesn't cover that up. It doesn't try to make him out to be something that he's not. He's human, just like you and me. And God knows this, right? He's aware of this. Humans, Hezekiah, all of us are imperfect. We have good days and bad. We succeed sometimes, and then the next day we fail. We have virtues and we have faults. This is not a surprise to God. But the thing is, God doesn't want to leave us there. He wants us to grow. He wants us to improve and make progress in our walk with Him. And in order to accomplish this, very often, God uses affliction. It's one of the tools in His kit that He can use to help us to grow and to improve. So that begs the question then, as Hezekiah is laying here sick and near death, did God make him sick? I don't know. And I don't know that anybody does. There's nothing in the text to indicate that. There's nothing in the text to say that he didn't either. It simply is not mentioned. We, do, we don't have any answer to that question. I don't think it really matters. Whether God caused his sickness or not, God can use these circumstances in order to accomplish his purpose either way. Maybe he did make Hezekiah sick for that purpose. Or maybe Hezekiah just got sick in the normal course of life and God said, oh, I'm going to use this in Hezekiah's life. Either way, it amounts to the same thing. So I don't think, I don't think we necessarily need an answer to that question. But this is per- one thing that is absolutely purposeful that we know. God sends Isaiah to deliver a message, right? Hezekiah is lying there sick in his bed, and Isaiah comes with a message. He tells the king, um, get your affairs in order because you're not going to recover from this, okay? So, you're done. Start putting your house in order. Why did he do that? He didn't have to do that, right? He could have just let this sickness run its course. And Hezekiah, just like everybody else, would have succumbed. You, you know, we're, we're all going to get, we're all going to come to the end some way, right? Some of us will live long lives and, and go peacefully in our sleep. Other people, we might get sick. Somebody might get run over by a car. We just don't know, right? But it's all, we're all going to get there someday. He could have just let, let the events run their course. He doesn't do that. He sends Isaiah with this message. And I think that the message is a warning. And the warning was designed to elicit a response in Hezekiah. And that response is, my first point. See, I think sickness can be a blessing when it prompts us to pray. Oh, I'm sorry. Forgot that one. Sickness is a blessing when it prompts us to pray. See, the implication in this story is that Hezekiah was not praying about his situation, right? Like, he's sick. He's really sick, but he's not talking to God about it. And, I, and I'll, I think I'll make this even more clear as we go a little bit later on. And so God sends Isaiah with this message in order to trigger that prayer in Hezekiah. Because God wants his people to pray. He wants us to talk to him about the tough stuff that we're going through. Not for his benefit, but for ours. It's not like we're telling God something that he doesn't know. It's not like we're, uh, you know, God, I know you don't know how to handle this, so let me, let me explain to you how, how, how this needs to go. You know, we don't need to do that. But God wants us to talk to him for our benefit. You guys know this, Philippians chapter 4, 6 and 7. This is a great 
Great one for refrigerator magnets and bumper stickers, right? Be anxious for nothing. Don't worry about anything. Why? But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Why? And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. I want you to notice, so he doesn't want us to worry when we're going through affliction. He wants us to pray about it and say, he wants us to talk to him. But for what purpose? Not for provision, but for peace. Right? He's, he's not saying, I want you to, to, to come to me to fix your every problem. That does happen sometimes. But that's not the primary purpose. The primary purpose is for peace. See, when something's bothering you and you go to the Lord in prayer and talk to him about it, he gives you peace. And not just any peace. The peace that surpasses all understanding. A supernatural peace. A peace that does not make any sense from a human perspective. Why does that work? Because we've released it. We put it in his hands. We said, you know what, I can't do anything about this, God. There's absolutely nothing that I can do about this, but I know that you can, and so I am leaving it with you. And I'm trusting that whatever happens, it's because you're in control, and you got this. <sighs> Weight has just been lifted. I don't have to worry about that anymore. I don't have to... I don't have to Lay, lay awake at night. I don't have to run around like a chicken with my head cut off trying to figure out how I'm going to fix this problem. I put it in the hands of the almighty creator of the universe. And I can leave it right there with him. Peace. Not provision, but peace. Now that's not to say that God doesn't answer prayers. He absolutely does. In James chapter 4 and verse 2, he tells us, you lust and do not have, you murder and covenant, can't obtain, you fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. What does that tell us? You don't have because you don't ask. That means you could have, right? If you would just ask. So God absolutely provides for our needs through prayer. I'm not saying that he doesn't. I'm just saying that's not the number one reason why we pray. The priority is we pray to receive the peace that passes all understanding so that we'll quit worrying. Secondarily, God also, by the way, sometimes answers prayer and gives us the very thing that we're asking for. Okay? And, and, and side note, by the way, this is not really on the topic, but God does change his mind. Right? Right? I think that's, that's evident through this passage that we're looking at. He went to Hezekiah and he said, hey, put your affairs in order, young man, because you don't have long left, right? You're not going to recover from this. Hezekiah prays, and then Isaiah has to turn around and deliver a second message. God heard your prayer. You got 15 more years. Did God lie the first time? No, that absolutely is what would have happened if Hezekiah had not reached out to him in prayer. The prayer changed God's mind. Now that doesn't, you know, wait a second, Pastor Sean, I thought God can't change. He doesn't change in his essential nature. He doesn't change his, his plan for the ages, those things that are set. But there is room within God's plan and in his nature for some variables, right? Just because he gave Hezekiah an extra 15 years doesn't upset the whole balance of the universe. There's room for a little bit of give and take in there. And I absolutely believe 100%, I believe in God's sovereignty. I believe that the, the end is already set. That stuff is determined. That doesn't mean there's not room for God to change his mind. Otherwise, he wouldn't say, hey, I, you could have had this if you would have asked for it. That, and, and what we're seeing with Hezekiah would not have happened. Now, I was all set with an illustration this morning, how I was going to, 
I was going to show you, I, most of you probably don't realize this, but I just spent the last couple days in Florida. My mom had her 75th anniversary, just flew back yesterday, um, and uh, we were coming back, we, uh, and while we were at the airport, we had a little hiccup. We missed our flight, um, and I had this great illustration. I, it was gonna, I was going to tell the story. It was going to be funny and entertaining and hilarious, and you would have loved it. Uh, and it would have illustrated the point perfectly. But then, you know, I realized this is actually not a funny situation. We're, we're talking about a man that's so sick that he's near death. And I actually know there's, there's lots of people in our church that are dealing with situations just like that. In fact, one in particular, I, I know not everybody's on our text list. And so you may not have gotten the news this morning. But if you did, then you know that even as we speak right now, Kylie Crocker is probably being life flighted. Uh, I don't know where she's going. Do you, Travis, do you know where she's going? Cincinnati. We don't, okay, so we don't know yet for sure. But they're going to send her somewhere because Toledo Children's cannot help her. Her kidney, uh, her liver is failing. It, her numbers are off the chart. They got to send her somewhere they can help her. So I decided to get rid of the funny story. And I would like right now, if everybody in this room would please join, we're going to pray for Kylie right now. Okay, I will be the one saying the words, but please join me in your hearts and let's all, every single one of us, lift our prayers up to the God who can change direction in people's lives for Kylie. Can we do that? Our Heavenly Father, we have absolutely no idea why you have allowed this affliction in the life of Kylie and her family right now, but we know it is difficult. It's tough. And right now, Kylie needs you more than she has ever needed you in her entire life. Lord, we know that you have the power to fix this situation, that you, if it was your will, you could heal her in an instant. And Lord, we would love it if that would happen. We also know, Lord, that you also use these things in people's lives. And so we are giving this to you right now. We're, we're putting this burden at your feet. And we're asking you, Lord, to help us to trust you with the outcome. And we pray for Kylie. We pray for her mom for her brothers and sisters, for her entire family, for Travis, who's here with us right now, for her dad, Brian. Lord, be with every single one of them. Surround them with your comfort and with your love. Help them to feel your presence in a mighty way, to know that you are not absent from this, but you are walking through this with them and that you are absolutely 100% in control. And Lord, I, I look forward to how you are going to work through this in such a way that we will see your hand at work. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. I didn't get it in the prayer bulletin this week, so please, when you get a chance, write that in and keep Kylie in your prayers this week. I know her family would appreciate that. Well, in this particular case, Hezekiah does what we just did. He gets the message that he's not going to make it, and he, it says he turns towards the wall, and I don't know what that means, by the way, but he turns his face towards the wall, and he prays, and he asks God to intervene in his situation, and he receives it, which leads to my second point. Sickness can be a blessing when it gives God the chance to reveal his glory. Extending a person's life by 15 years, that's pretty special, right? I, I mean, who can do that? Only God can do that. But that's also hard to see, right? How, how, how do you go to somebody and say, hey, God added 15 years to my life. How do you know that? 
How, how can we be sure that you were really going to go? Well, Isaiah told me. How did Isaiah know? Well, God told him. Oh, okay, right? You can't, it's, it's not tangible. It's not something you can hold on to. It absolutely happens, but how do you, sh- how do you demonstrate that to somebody? You can't. It would just be, they could, they could dismiss it as a, oh yeah, okay, so you, I understand. That's how you think it happened, right? But it's just a coincidence. And so, God gives a sign to Hezekiah, and he makes the, the shadow, you guys know what a sundial, how that works, right? The sun comes and makes a shadow, and the shadow points at the numbers on the dial. So how do you, cha- how do you make a sundial? It's not like, like if I take that clock down, I can just twist the little thing on the back and it'll go backwards, but I'm not really changing time, right? How do you make a sun- the shadow on a sundial go backwards? I think there's only, two, there's only two ways I can think of. Either he stopped the earth and started turning it the other direction. That would be a pretty big deal. Or somehow he bent the light in such a way that only just on that one sundial on all the planet, every, every other sundial kept going just like it was, but that one sundial suddenly went backwards. Which, which of those two, or maybe you can think of a third one. Those are only two I can come up with. Okay, there you go, time. I, I don't know. How did he do it? I don't know. I don't know how he did it. Here's what I do know. Only God could do that, right? It's beyond natural explanation. You can't say, oh, well, you know, it had something to do with the clouds. No, uh-uh. Right, there's no other way to explain this. Okay, And I believe the reason God does this, the reason he turns the shadow on that sundial is to provide confirmation, right? So the people who were there and witnesses, God added 15 years to Hezekiah's life. How do you know that? Let me tell you about the sundial. I saw it, right? God's glory is revealed in many ways through afflictions. Okay, this, we're looking at, at one very unique example of that. And by God doing it this way, that story can't be dismissed. When the miraculous is involved, right? When suddenly the cancer is, and the doctors are like, wait, what happened? You were sick yesterday. How come it's all gone now, right? When, when, we hear stories like that sometimes, right? When that happens, that's when we go, praise the Lord. Only he could do that. And when that stuff happens, it's great. But there, there are other ways that God receives glory. It doesn't require some miraculous shifting of the earth or the light. I already, I, I actually, I, I didn't mention it. I was supposed to mention 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 7. I skipped it earlier because I, I jumped over it. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, um, Paul talks about this thing called a thorn in the flesh that he was given, right? God gave him this thorn in the flesh. And he did it for two reasons. One was because Paul had a pride problem, right? And this, that's what we were going to talk about earlier that I forgot, so sorry about that. He gave it to him to, as a reminder, don't get proud, Paul, okay? But then he goes on in verse 9 to say this, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. In other words, God is glorified, in in Paul's case, God was glorified by him not miraculously fixing the problem, by him not doing this great healing, right? He said, I'm going to let you stay this way, Paul, so that you can bring me glory. That's hard for us to see. We We want the other kind, we want God to do the miracle. We want him to take, you know, so that we can run around and say, hey, let me tell you what God did, this crazy thing. You won't believe it. It was amazing. We love to give God the praise and the glory that way, don't we? Not so easily say, I want to give God glory because he gave me this thorn in my flesh and I can't get rid of it. That's a lot harder to do, but it is possible because that's why he gave it to Paul. 
Because then Paul could testify, he could go around testifying, it's not me, guys. I'm just this weak, humble thing. If you see anything happening to me, it's all to the glory of God. We see it in other places too, right? You guys remember John chapter 9? Jesus and the disciples come along, a, 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 a man born blind from his birth, right? He's been blind his whole life. And the disciples say, hey, Rabbi, they're talking to Jesus. Who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind, right? And Jesus said, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. (laughs) And then he proceeds to heal him, right? See it again in John chapter 11, verse 4 death of Lazarus, right? He, God, Jesus receives the message, Lazarus, your friend is sick, and he waits. He waits. He doesn't immediately go. He waits, and in, the, and in the meantime, Lazarus passes away. And then he says, okay, guys, now it's time to go. And they're like, why should we bother now? And when Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God that the Son of God may be glorified through it. See, see, God receives glory through our affliction, whether it's a thorn in the flesh like Paul that we spend the rest of our lives dealing with, or whether it's a miraculous healing like the man born blind or like Lazarus. God can receive the glory through our affliction. Well, um, the last thing that I want to talk to you about is that God, that the... Uh, Um, sickness can be a blessing when it gives us the chance to reflect and evaluate. That's what we see uh, happening next. So in verse 9, you'll notice it says, this is the writing of Hezekiah, king of Judah, when he had been sick and had recovered from his sickness. So what this is telling us is this takes place sometime later, right? Uh, We... I think we could refer to these next few verses as a psalm. Hezekiah writes a psalm, or perhaps, you know, you might think of it as he's writing in his journal or his diary, right? He, he, he is um, looking back on this experience that we read in verses 1 through 8. He's figuring out what it all means. And he's reflecting on what he learned from this whole process. And I think that's an example we all should follow from time to time. What a waste it is to go through affliction, to suffer, and then not get any good out of it, right? To suffer for no reason. But Hezekiah took some time to reflect on the experience and to learn from it. So what did Hezekiah learn? Well, let's read together, starting in verse 10. Hezekiah writes, I said, in the prime of my life, I shall go to the gates of Sheol. I am deprived of the remainder of my years. I said, I shall not see Yah, the Lord, in the land of the living. I shall observe man no more among the inhabitants of the world. My lifespan is gone, taken from me like a shepherd's tent. I have cut off my life like a weaver. He cuts me off from the loom. From day until night, you make an end of me. I have considered until morning like a lion. So he breaks all my bones. From day until night, you make an end of me. Like a crane or a swallow, so I chattered. I mourned like a dove. My eyes fail from looking upwards. O Lord, I am oppressed. Undertake for me. What shall I say? He has both spoken to me and he himself has done it. I shall walk carefully all my years in the bitterness of my soul. O Lord, by these things men live and in all these things, in the life of my spirit, so you will restore me and make me live. Indeed, it was for my own peace that I had great bitterness. But you have lovingly delivered my soul from the pit of corruption. For you have cast all my sins behind your back. For Sheol cannot thank you. Death cannot praise you. Those who go down to the pit cannot hope for your truth. The living The living man, he shall praise you as I do this day. The father shall make known your truth to the children. See, I think what this psalm reveals to us in the first part is that Hezekiah 
in his sickness was having a pity party. He was feeling sorry for himself. Life was unfair. But notice in verse 14 it says, his eyes fail from looking upward. And I think that can mean one of two things. It it means either he was looking up and blaming God for what he he was going through, like this was his fault or something, or that he just, he, he was... He wasn't looking up at all. He failed to do that. He, he, he didn't seek God in his sickness. Either way, he, he failed. But then, of course, as we know, God sends him a warning. And the warning changes him. And now, either his prayer changes from one of, you know, why did you do this to me, Lord, to something different, or... He starts praying, which he wasn't doing before. And only then, only when that happens, does what happens next, where it says, oh Lord, I am oppressed, undertake for me. Okay, that's the point at which he started praying or praying rightly. What would have happened if God had not intervened in his life at that moment to give him that warning? He would have continued down that same road. He would have continued having that pity party. And as he mentions in verse 15 and again in verse 17, that would have led to bitterness. He says it twice. In the, I shall walk carefully in all my years in the bitterness of my soul. Indeed, it was for my own peace that I had great bitterness. That's, that is where Hezekiah was. Feeling sorry for himself feeling oppressed and, and uh, life is unfair. He didn't deserve this. And it was making him bitter. And God sends Isaiah with a message. <laughs> and the message is, hey, you're done. Seems counterintuitive, but that is what Hezekiah needed to hear. And he begins now to reach out to the Lord. And to ask for his mercy. To ask to be delivered from this sickness. And God sends Isaiah back and says, I heard your prayer. You just earned yourself 15 more years. And he praises God in the second half of 17 for delivering his soul from the pit of corruption. Not because he healed his body. Not because he gave him extended life. Because you delivered my soul. I was headed down the path of bitterness. You saved me from that. Of course, we know that that is the most important thing, isn't it? I mean, it's great when God does something truly miraculous and wonderful and providential in our life. And we we thank him for those things. But nothing compares to what he has done for our soul. By sending his son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross, to take our place. And no, he didn't make my life perfect by doing that. But he has made my eternity perfect by doing that. And because of that, I can endure whatever affliction I have to go through on this planet knowing what I have to look forward at the end of it. Well, finally, he concludes in verse 20. He says, the Lord was ready to save me. Therefore, we will sing my songs with stringed instruments all the days of our life in the house of the Lord. He gives praise to God for what he has done in his life. And Hezekiah's faith and his spiritual walk was made stronger because of this affliction that he went through. Not just the experience itself, that was part of it, but also because he evaluated and he learned from it. The Bible refers to this process as refining. And that's actually a metaphor, right? Refining, we know, is when you take a rock out of the ground 
and you melt it so hot, you, you make it so hot that it melts so that you can skim off the junk and only leave the valuable ore behind. That's the refining process. The Bible uses that as a metaphor for our spiritual walk. Just as miners remove the impurities to make the ore, the precious ore, more valuable, God does the same thing in our life. We don't have to look very far. You can turn right to Isaiah 48, verse 10, where it says, Behold, I have refined you, not as silver. I have tested you in the furnace of of affliction that the the heat of affliction is how we are refined as people malachi chapter 3 we see it again but who can endure the day of his coming and who can stand when he appears for he is like a refiner's fire he will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver he will purify the sons of levi and purge them as gold and silver and of course, he does the same in our life. We see it in 1 Peter chapter 1, 6 and 7. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you've been grieved by various trials, afflictions, that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We're being refined by our afflictions. He's using them to help to mold and shape us into something that's more precious than when it started. By, by skimming off the dross, getting rid of the junk, and leaving behind what is valuable. And the more he does that, the closer we come to the likeness of Jesus Christ the better off we are. Now there's, we have a couple more verses here, 21 and 22, but we're going to hold off on those. I'm going to deal with those next week. So just put a bookmark there and we'll get back to those. But let me ask you this before we close. Are you going through a tough situation right now? And it can be sickness, but it doesn't have to be. It can be a lot of different things. It can be financial. It can be troubles at work. It can be problems in your relationship, right? You fill in the blank. Whatever it is that you're dealing with right now, are you doing, dealing with something tough? Then here's what I want to say to you. Rejoice. Rejoice that you are going through a tough time right now. And I'm not making that up, right? That's what the scripture says. James chapter 1, verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, among other things, right? We're being refined. There's the reason you're going through that is God is going to use that in your life to make you better than you are. So rejoice. Rejoice. That is not easy to do, especially when you're in the middle of it. I understand that. But we can train ourselves, right? Because we know this. I'm in a tough situation right now, but God is working through my tough situation for my good. And you guys know that one too, right? Romans 8, 28. You can, most of you can quote it. All, we all know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. How many things? All things, good and bad, happy days and affliction. They work for our good. If you love God, if you've been called according to his purpose, this will work for your good. That's a promise. But we have to train ourselves. That's not easy to do, especially when you're in the thick of it. Okay? So, how are we going to do that? I think this passage gives us the perfect example to emulate. Do what we saw in the life of Hezekiah. First, pray. Right? 
pray. That's step one. And oh, by the way, you don't have to pray by yourself. Right? James chapter 5. You know, if any, are you sick? Go call the elders of the church and let them pray. And later on, the same passage says, and everybody else, let's all pray for one another. You don't have to go it alone. You, you, sh- you should pray, and your prayers are important, and, but don't keep it to yourself. Let us know so we can pray with you. That's, that's part of our job as the church. So step one, pray. Step two, ask, start asking some questions. Lord, what are you trying to teach me through this? Why have you allowed this into my life? And importantly, how can I use this for your glory? Right? Start asking those questions. And then three, take time, whatever the outcome, to reflect, to evaluate, and to learn. If we do that, we will start seeing God at work through our afflictions And we will be able to give him all the praise and glory for what he's doing in our lives. Now, as you can see before you, we have a perfect opportunity today to reflect and to evaluate. And I'm going to ask Pastor Tim to come and lead us through that. Gentlemen, you can come forward. The greatest story of affliction Isaiah 53, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of suffering who knew what sickness was. He was like someone people turned away from. He was despised and we didn't value him. Yet he himself bore our sickness and carried our pains, but we in turn regarded him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But... He was pierced for our rebellion, crushed because of our iniquities, and the punishment for our peace was on him, and we are healed by his wounds. The greatest story ever told. Jesus Christ afflicted, punished for my sin, for your sin. And we come now remembering that sacrifice that he made so that we may have peace with him. He did all of this, it says, because our peace was on him. And we are healed by his wounds. We are made whole by his sacrifice on the cross, his death, burial, and resurrection. We should therefore remember that and in so doing proclaim his death until he comes again Lord would you pray for the bread our father in heaven we come to you just reflecting upon the greatest gift that you ever gave us, your Son, Jesus Christ, for allowing him to go through the affliction, the pain, the suffering, and most of all, the death. For his body was broken, and it became sin to him. As we look in life and see our bodies broken, Father, help us to know what cost it was that Jesus was willing to be obedient to you, dear Lord, our God, and went to that cross, laying his precious life down 
as we reflect as, at this time, we take the bread, and it represents his body that was broken. Help us to be mindful of that, and Lord, that we would just uh, give testimony of your greatness through our reflection as days come and go. We just give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, For I received from the Lord what I also pass on to you. On the night in which he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is the body, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Deacon Mark Miller, would you pray for the cup? Father in heaven, we thank you so much for Jesus who came to this earth and shed his blood so that we might be forgiven, so that we might come back to you, Lord. And, and Lord, we just, as we partake of this cup, we remember the blood that Jesus willingly gave as a way of cleansing us from our sins. Lord, Lord, we know in the scriptures it tells us without the shedding of the blood there can be no remission of sins. And Lord God, we just thank you so much for this sacrifice that Jesus made for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank mm -hmm. you.
In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Would you stand and join us in our last song? I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall end. Sweat drops of blood for mine. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. He took my sins and my sorrows. He made them his very own. He bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my sin love for me when with the ransom in glory his face I at last shall see to be my joy through the ages to sing of his love for me how marvelous how wonderful and my song shall ever Father, we thank you for that wonderful, marvelous love that you have given to us, that Jesus Christ was afflicted and wounded for our transgressions, but by his wounds we are healed. We thank you for that today. In your name we pray, amen. We will be beginning our meal shortly, so even if you haven't brought anything, please join us downstairs for our harvest dinner. Thank you.